the topic of our round, round table today, as, as, as you know, is assessing the risk uh, and also understanding the role that is played by Chinese companies uh, that are present in the architecture of OpenRAN. Uh, my name is Andrew Davenport, and I'm a longtime board member uh, of the Prague Security Studies Institute. Um, I also help run a risk consultancy in Washington, D.C. that focuses on the global business uh, footprints and activities of, of Chinese companies. Um, this has been a point of focus for us for at least uh, 10 years, so we're steeped in this issue. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Prague Securities Institute, we were founded in 2002 with a mission to help safeguard and strengthen the freedoms and democratic institutions of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Our educational programs for students in the region to train future generations of security professionals have been a flagship undertaking during this time, uh, as has our emphasis on unconventional and underdeveloped threats, which is a specialty at PSSI, particularly in the economic and financial and space domains. I'll be kicking off uh, our session today with a brief overview of the facts associated with today's topic. And then I'll be bringing in our esteemed speakers uh, each of whom will be adding to the conversation with their expert views on this topic. And uh, per our agenda, as you likely already know, uh, our speakers today include Beryl Thomas, who is a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, um, Mikal Tim, who is a research fellow at the Association of International Affairs, AMO, in the Czech Republic, as well as uh, Hosok Lee Makiyama, who is the director of the European Center for International Political Economy. So you'll hear from them shortly and um, will benefit from their wisdom on this topic. Um, for those of you, just to kick off with kind of a baseline description of the facts and the situation um, before diving into discussion and then Q&A when we're, when we're finished with the speaker's comments. Um, for those of you not familiar with Open RAN, the term is used to describe a new approach to 5G network development, which has been advocated for by several industry association, associations, including the ORAN Alliance and seeks the establishment of industry-wide interface standards that permit operators to use RAN uh, radio access network equipment and software from different vendors. Uh, Open RAN has attracted significant support, including in the United States, for a number of reasons, including the promise that it offers for operators to mix and match RAN components from different manufacturers, rather than having to hire a vendor to build a proprietary end-to-end -end solution. Um, the appeal of this model for its supporters is primarily that it offers an alternative to the existing market for network development, uh, especially as operators are looking to 5G, where it's hoped that Open RAN will create a more flexible, cost-effective approach. And uh, while this may not be on the advertising materials for these products, it's clear that the momentum uh, behind Open RAN owes a lot to the issues associated with Huawei. Uh, a previously leading Chinese player in this industry and the challenges associated with avoiding uh, their equipment for those concerned about the cybersecurity and other issues uh, associated with hiring a Chinese vendor for sensitive critical infrastructure. But the purpose of today's session is to help really ensure that some of the same risks that have already emerged as understood concerns, understood concerns associated with 5G and associated with, with Huawei are not overlooked uh, in the pursuit of solutions based on Open RAN. So although the risk considerations uh, associated with Chinese involvement in Open RAN are certainly different uh, than, for example, hiring Huawei to deliver an end-to-end -end solution, it's worth remembering that some of the concern associated with Huawei was based on the lack of confidence in the Chinese Communist Party, their track record in the cyber domain, and the risk associated with their influence over their companies which is not necessarily particular to Huawei, and hence why it's reasonable to ask the question about you know, which Chinese companies might also be involved in Open RAN, which is a solution that at least in part is intended to um, get around some of those issues. So as Open RAN is accepted in some places as a solution that avoids these problems, one of the purposes of this roundtable is to ensure awareness of the role that Chinese companies continue to play uh, even in this solution, so that proper diligence and policy can be adopted um, in, in a model that, at least in some ways, is intended to be a bit of a replacement. 
um, two of the world's leading groups with regard to the development and advancement of Open RAN solutions are the ORAN Alliance and the Open RAN Project Group of the Telecom Infra Project. The ORAN Alliance is an international industry group that is defining the shared specifications and standards that are underpinning Open RAN. And the other group, the Open RAN Project Group, works to advance innovation and commercialization of the concept uh, with new products and solutions. And it's um, per this round table, Chinese entities are present in both groups, um, but most prominently, I would say, in the, in the ORAN Alliance. So to kick us off um, and to get a little bit specific about uh, that involvement, um, a few points to be aware of. Um, China, China Mobile, as a leading state-owned telecom enterprise of China, serves as a founding and permanent member of the group of the ORAN Alliance. Uh, China Mobile sits on its board of directors, as well as its executive committee. Uh, China Mobile also sits on um, the ORAN Alliance's influential technical steering committee. Um, additionally, over 40 other Chinese entities are among ORAN Alliance's members and contributors. And uh, among the members of the group that are primarily mobile operators that are involved in testing and testing the resulting technology are China Mobile, China Telecom, and China Unicom. Uh, each of these three companies are state-owned Chinese entities. Uh, each have recently been identified by the U.S. Department of Defense as communist Chinese military companies, um, a public list that is disclosed by the Pentagon by law. Um, each of these companies was subsequently delisted for the same reason by the New York Stock Exchange um, within the past few months. Um, all three companies, just for example, have been accused of providing communication systems in the disputed Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. So, um, you know, and in that instance, not only to service civilian and military personnel, but also to upgrade daily operations, including signals intelligence and location services. Certain of these same three companies have documented involvement in China's military civil fusion program, which is a program intended to leverage private sector technology for military purposes. Um, that's just a snippet of, you know, the, the risk profile of some of these entities uh, involved at a rather senior level. Uh, meanwhile, another category of involvement at the ORAN Alliance are contributors, and these are entities that sign up to take part in proposing standards uh, at the ORAN Alliance, and there are over three dozen uh, Chinese entities among this group, and they include ZTE, which um, has been targeted alongside Huawei for similar reasons in recent years. They were also designated as recently as March of this year by the Federal Communications Commission of the United States as raising national security risks. Uh, Innsberg Group is also a contributor, and they have also been listed by the Pentagon as a Chinese, as a communist Chinese military company. Uh, that occurred last year. And then finally, uh, another contributor is the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology. Um, whose experts have allegedly contributed to major CCP initiatives, such as the same uh, cybersecurity law that has contributed to governments around the world questioning the wisdom of inviting Chinese companies into their 5G infrastructure, notably Huawei. Um, finally, before kicking it over to, to Beryl, uh, finally, it's worth noting uh, that a survey by a Chinese securities company in November of 2020 uh, stated that China is already an important link in the global open RAN industrial chain. So particularly in components, uh, including filters and connectors. So as the open RAN project moves forward, it seems likely that this trend will continue or even accelerate uh, as more Chinese firms enter the industry to manufacture the subcomponents that will make up the disaggregated open RAN network. So this is just to say that ultimately, while open RAN might deliver a solution that replaces the model of end-to-end -end solution providers, or at least provi uh, puts forward an alternative, um, with the ability to mix and match parts across standardized virtual automated systems using open interfaces, that many of its component pieces are at risk uh, of ending up originating in China, uh, manufactured by Chinese companies. So this would likely require persistent risk management, uh, even, in the, even if the adoption of Open RAN uh, takes hold to address really some of the same concerns that have existed for 5G recently. So with that general orientation, I thought I'd uh, pass the microphone over to Beryl Thomas. And uh, as I mentioned, she's a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she's focused her research on the geopolitics of 5G and emerging technologies and their impact on transatlantic relations. 
She previously worked as a project assistant with the Asia Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council in the United States. And um, Beryl will start us off by broadening the lens a bit on the issue of risks presented by Open RAN, indeed, uh, including uh, those that go beyond the question of the involvement of Chinese companies to broaden the, the lens again just a bit um, as we dive into some of the issues with greater specificity. Um, I'll turn it over to Beryl. Hi, um, well, thanks very much to Andrew and to the Prague Security Studies Institute for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this discussion today. Uh, in this first session, I'll talk a bit about the interest in and the drive behind OpenRAN and share some of my observations on OpenRAN shortcomings. So as Andrew mentioned, OpenRAN is not a new kind of telecom technology, but rather a concept. It's an idea that existing tech can be configured in new ways for enhanced interoperability within the radio access portion of a network. And this means that instead of having a proprietary system from a single supplier, a true standards-based open RAN would allow operators to select components made by any manufacturer and arrange them as desired within their radio access networks, giving them far greater flexibility than what we see with traditional network buildouts. Over the last few years, there's been growing awareness of the need for reliable ICT, which we've all experienced under the pandemic and which we're, we're having even now with our, our virtual roundtable here today. So there's been a lot of discussion and debate on both sides of the Atlantic as to the threat posed by Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE and their presence in telecom networks across Europe. Sentiment against Chinese tech has grown stronger, as Andrew said, and Open RAN is increasingly viewed as a solution to this China Huawei problem. And one of Open RAN's biggest selling points is that it allows for the increased vendor diversity within the network, reducing the presence of high risk vendors and lessening the hold proprietary or single source vendors have in the radio access market. The idea here is that OpenRAN would allow operators to choose from a wider selection of components built to an agreed upon standard, which assures their interoperability and which allows operators more variety in sourcing components regardless of manufacturer. But one of the main problems here is that the standards underpinning an OpenRAN network have not yet been established and set by a recognized standards authority. Because these standards aren't yet fully established, the OpenRAN networks we're seeing tested in Japan and the US and other places are not truly interoperable. This means that as of now, there is no guarantee that Open RAN will work in the way that it is hoped or that it will perform up to the standards which experts are, uh, are counting on. And the second issue here, which we'll come to a bit later in today's program, is the fact that while Open RAN is thought to be free of Huawei and therefore Beijing's influence, Chinese companies are significantly involved in the ORAN alliance working on establishing the standards for Open RAN. But to sort of get back to the perceived benefits of open RAN, it's thought to be more economical from a cost perspective. Because operators are not locked into single vendors in building their networks, they can choose the components that are less specialized and customize them in the way that works best for their needs. The idea is that open RAN would make the network components less proprietary and therefore less expensive. But because these components have to be individually designed for flexibility over optimization in order to give the operators this variety of choice, they are no longer streamlined for efficiency in the way that they would be in a traditional network build. And when it comes to the effect that this has on speed, performance, and even energy consumption, the economic savings associated with Open RAN may not be fully realized. And just a quick note on security. Given the way the components interact, the enhanced connectivity in an Open RAN network is a result of increased interfaces allowing the components to work together theoretically seamlessly but more interfaces means more points of connection and more points of connection can simultaneously mean more avenues of vulnerability. So each, inter each interface presents an opening in the network that needs to be secured and protected from malicious actors, regardless of Chinese intent, just your general cybersecurity threats. In a traditional network, this, these security considerations are created and determined from the outset and sort of reinforced throughout the build. But because the flexibility of components in an open RAN network is what underpins the whole idea and offers multiple ways to set up the network, the security considerations have to be taken into account sort of after the fact. So along with Chinese influence in setting the standards for open RAN, there are just general security concerns, significant ones regarding the security considerations of open RAN. And here I think we can maybe briefly turn towards the geopolitical considerations. So for European countries navigating the US-China tech rivalry, Open RAN appears to be a solution for vendor diversity and eliminating untrustworthy vendors in their domestic networks. These are all goals outlined in the Prague proposals, 
the EU's 5G toolbox and the EU's 2030 digital compass, which aims to help the EU become a tech leader and innovator in 5G and beyond. Open Run is also thought to help the EU achieve its goals of becoming more independent or more digitally sovereign and less dependent on China or the United States. By diversifying the market, the idea is that smaller European companies would be able to specialize in a specific component and competitively offer it in the marketplace. But in attempting this, European companies will be competing with established ecosystems in China, in the United States, and in Japan, which are already, already heavily invested in the tech needed for Open Run. And again, touching back on the idea that speed, performance, and efficiency may be lacking in Open RAN as compared to a traditional network build, the move towards Open RAN may not be in line with Europe's transition towards green technologies. And I think one final important note on Open RAN, European policymakers are viewing it as a way to sort of work with allies and standing up to China's tech dominance in general. Conversations on tech cooperation were a main theme of the G7 and NATO communiques earlier this month, and countries like the United States, Japan, India, all of European partners are investing significant amounts of money in pursuing Open RAN, but they're all approaching it from a place of cooperation with like-minded partners as a solution to the China Huawei question. Whether or not this will be a successful strategy, I think we'll touch on that in the next few sessions. And so with that, Andrew, um, I'll stop there and hand it back over to you. Thank you, Beryl. Um, we'll move on to um, Mikhail Tim from here, who is a research fellow and a China and cyber expert at AMO in Prague, the Association of International Affairs. Uh, he was a director of the AMO Research Center from July 2007 to August 2010. And uh, I understand he intends to address the question of the compatibility uh, between Open RAN and the Prague 5G proposals. Uh, but Mikhail, I'll let you take it from there. and. Uh, perhaps frame your comments uh, as you wish with respect to the, those issues and others. Nicole? Thank you, Andrew. Um, so the question that was given to me um, in the description panel is whether uh, prior proposals uh, are, or open run is, is consistent with the prior proposals. And uh, it's one of those um, issues where the question is uh, both yes and no. Um, in fact, uh, prior proposals uh, stayed on, on at least a couple of times, stresses the importance of, of uh, diversity of uh, equipment market. Uh, it states, for example, a diverse and vibrant communications equipment market and supply chain are essential for security and economic resilience of the network, of the 5G network, and that investment in research and development benefits the global economy and technological advancement and is a way to potentially increase diversity of technological solutions with positive effects on security of communication networks. And uh, Open Run is something that, that, that seeks to uh, deliver on this, on this promise of, of diversity, uh, at least on this perception that the, uh, that, uh, the market for 5G solutions is uh, somehow nearing uh, uh, some form of uh, vendor lock-in that you have only a couple of uh, couple of options to, to, to choose from. However, the, the no part of the consistency of open run with, with prior proposals is that uh, it's not uh, it's not very consistent with the with, with the let's say the main idea of, of uh, prior uh, proposals, and that is to raise the issue that that uh, the security of five G networks is not just a technical matter. It's uh, it's also it also includes uh, a range of uh, non-technical aspects. And one of them is, uh, is a supply chain security or, or risk profile of, uh, of the country suppliers. And uh, in that respect, the uh, proposal states that over risk of influence on the supplier by a third country should be taken into account, notably in relation to its model of governance, the absence of cooperation agreements on security and similar ar uh, arrangements. Um, that, of course, uh, um, aims uh, mostly at China uh, and uh, at the uh, political and, and legal system within which uh, Chinese uh, companies uh, uh, operate. And uh, it is uh, that this passage in, in, five, in prior proposals is uh, 
uh, there's a direct link between between this this text and the assessment that that came from the uh, uh, Czech National Cyber Information Security Agency warning issued in December 2018, and uh, the key wording in that warning was that the legal and political environment of the People's Republic of China in which the companies primarily operate and whose laws are required to comply with requires private companies to cooperate in meeting the interests of the People's Republic of China, including participation in intelligence activities. That follows uh, uh, later. This raises concerns that the interests of the PRC may be prioritized over the interests of the users of these companies' technologies. So um, if we, if we, um, uh, if the endpoint of of, uh, of this current development is that that the open run is uh, 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 dominated by um, a bunch of uh, Chinese vendors, not necessarily Huawei and ZTE, that that uh, uh, that are uh, two of the five major players in in, in current uh, 5G technologies infrastructure, uh, by other Chinese companies. Um, then we are back to basically back to square uh, back to square one and, and the promise of open run uh, to promote more diversity and more security is is uh, is not there is not met and uh, perhaps uh, for those people in the public um, uh, listening listening to this uh, uh, some of the uh, legal provisions um, uh, in people's republic of china that that this uh, uh, relevant to this discussion I'll mention just just a couple of uh, perhaps uh, uh, perhaps the first one is the state security law of 2015 uh, that is uh, that is in a way a, a law that that frames the uh, state security uh, uh, state security discussion in the People's Republic of China. It, it creates some kind of legal framework uh, for follow-on regulations and. Um, in Articles 4 and 15, it, it, it establishes the leadership of the Communist Party of China on, on state security issues. So here we, here we have the clear expression of, of party state interest. Uh, the key uh, law, of course, is uh, state intelligence law from, uh, of 2017, and especially Articles uh, 7 and 4 that define obligation of uh, entities, both individual and organizations, uh, to support uh, national intelligence work and to provide cooperation and to keep secrecy about the secrets they learn in connection with national intelligence work. That in a sense means that if, if uh, a Chinese company uh, is asked by uh, state intelligence apparatus in, in People's Republic of China to cooperate, they are also legally bound to, to keep this uh, cooperation secret. Uh, they cannot reveal it in any way, uh, shape or form. And, uh, so that's uh, that's something that no no Chinese company, and then again we are uh, not talking just about how NZT, that's something that no Chinese company can uh, escape from uh, because uh, this this uh, party state interest will be always there, and it's not it, it's not just that uh, Chinese companies are uh, under threat uh, from the state, they are uh, very willing to cooperate because it it uh, it brings them uh, government subsidies. It, it raises their uh, profile in the People's Republic of China. It's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a mutually beneficial cooperation. And uh, in this respect, and if you talk about open run, one of the concerning developments recently is that uh, uh, a subsidiary of Tencent Group uh, is uh, investing in, in uh, Japanese company Rakuten that was considered to be one of the, one of the uh, let's say leading companies on open run development so this that's uh, so it's not only uh, chinese companies uh, participation direct in open on open run but also uh, chinese companies investment in, in other companies that that, in, that are uh, participating in open open run development and on a final note uh, this uh, this development we see in, in, in connection with open run uh, uh, and that likely seeks to bypass the higher attention given to risk profile of Chinese companies uh, present in 5G infrastructure. Um, we have been witnessing something similar on, on, uh, in, in other areas. And one of them is uh, uh, 
and one of them is a discussion on on internet governance and uh, you may you may be aware that uh, one of the strategic goals of, of people's republic of china is to uh, they say reform uh, the way that the uh, current internet is governed uh, in a way that it, it would be more under the control of, of uh, uh, national states rather than uh, you know consortia of uh, NGOs and, and, and companies and and other organizations that are not directly under state control. Uh, while on strategic level this uh, this effort has so far been unsuccess unsuccessful, there is a there is a great push. Uh, 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 of uh, Chinese companies in concert with with the Chinese foreign policy uh, uh, and other uh, and other uh, state bodies to change the discussion from bottom. And so uh, uh, there's there's a massive uh, uh, participation of Chinese companies in in various technical fora, uh, trying to change the standards, trying to change the um, the um, let's say the uh, uh, something that, that's below the strategic level of of, uh, of internet governance, uh, the, the the standards that 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 create, that basically creates the internet and and uh, makes it work as it is. So uh, I see there is a parallel between between Chinese efforts on on uh, internet governance and and uh, what we see uh, uh, in terms of Chinese companies' participation in open run. And with that, I will I will yield the floor back to you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Mikal. Very interesting. Um, look forward to picking back up on some of those strands, uh, hopefully uh, in the Q&A session. Um, next up, we have uh, Hosok Lee Makiyama, who is uh, director of the European Center for International Political Economy, as I mentioned. He's also a fellow um, at the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics. And uh, he's a leading expert on trade diplomacy, EU-China relations, and the digital economy. He has written extensively on the cybersecurity challenges presented by high-risk vendors, uh, including those from China involved in 5G and open RAN solutions and the implications for Europe and the world. Um, and I'll turn the floor over uh, to Hosuk to elaborate. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you to PSSI for having me today. And uh, I think a lot of uh, the, well, the most important things have been said. So please do bear with me if I become repetitive. I have the tendency, um, but I think it's a very important and also timely subject considering, well, uh, first of all, we have a debate that is now commencing in uh, Europe and uh, just before the weekend, um, the, um, the council and the um, the commission announced actually that there will be a analysis of the implication of the 5G open RAN. So I think uh, the timing of this event is uncanny. And also we have a couple of major pieces of legislation in the US that promises support for open RAN, which is not in itself a problem, but we need to deal with, understand what it is and uh, how we best support something like open RAN. And I absolutely agree with Andrew and Beryl and also Michal that this is a philosophy buzzword, if you like, rather than an actually a clear definition. And I think also the policy response is going to be very difficult given that this is something that is extremely hard to define. And so therefore I think it's very important we understand what we are talking about and also to be very, very clear about when we talk about open RAN, which is the buzzword, but also all RAN, which is a private consortium of primarily US and Chinese companies. And uh, it operates as a standard, standard setting body, but it is private and where Chinese operators as well as uh, US and the Europeans have a veto uh, in how the specification is set. And this is purely private and there are some legal consequence of that, but we'll save that for another discussion. I'm here to talk about China and uh, I want to actually add another point before we go into the China and security aspect of Open RAN, which is that uh, we have heard about technical solutions that have been, for example, provided by Japan. Rakuten has been named. That is OPEN RAN, but it's not necessarily ORAN. 
So it is an open RAN technology that is based on the virtualization, the use of AI and cloud-based, et cetera, that basically erases the, the boundary between the traditional operator and cloud services private provider, but it's not part of the private consortium. It's a completely proprietary technology. And as a proprietary technology, you have a different kind of trust depending on one vendor. But if you have a open technical specification that is created by a private consortium, it becomes very important to look at every one in the consortium that might be contributing to, to its code. So that's a very important point to make. I will be mostly talking, talking about ORAN because as I said, I don't think open RAN is necessarily a problem. Virtualization, use of AI, as I said, and cloud, these are all gonna be a part of the future. If you don't integrate it in your solution in the future, in the 5G network technology, you're gonna be left behind. And then it doesn't really matter how much subsidies you receive or don't receive. You're not gonna be a part of the future solution beyond 6G anyway. So many of the underlying technologies of OPERAN is actually inevitable and we'll get there somewhere. But let's, let us go back to where we are now today, 5G and uh, both OPERAN as well as the ORAN consortium. And I think uh, the, the first point that I would like to make is that it operates in a very, very different way uh, than we have seen so far on the 3GPP, which is the traditional technology that we have access to. And the reason is because the collaborative model is different and also the, the deliverables are different. So it is very true that under the 3GPP, according to the existing technique, uh, well, the traditional uh, uh, solutions, you still have standards set by, well, both uh, European, US, Japanese, and Chinese standard uh, designated um, organizations. But the difference here is that they don't write each other's codes. So in other words, there is probably not a single line of code, a Huawei code, in, let's say in uh, Ericsson and Nokia or NEC or Samsung equipment or vice versa. It's effectively a way to create interoperability between base stations and devices to make sure that everyone can talk to each other, but they don't actually necessarily develop code together. This is the difference between the 3GPP standard setting and ORAN, the private consortium, where actually, well, nearly 100 companies are actually working together to write code together. That puts the standard, well, basically the, the, the model of collaboration in a very, very different, well, uh, different approaches than we are used to. So that actually calls for a completely new way of looking at uh, the, uh, the, the code that, that has been developed together. And one of the problem here, I think, is that if you're looking at uh, even a traditional uh, 3GPP equipment or uh, 4G versus 5G, it doesn't really matter. The amount of code that goes into a base station is so vast and the bandwidth and the resources that is available for the security agencies for any country, uh, Europe, United States, or China is extremely limited. And already I can tell you today for 4G equipment, the waiting time to actually get network equipment approved of today's hardware-based 4G equipment could be up to 18 months. And you haven't actually been able to scrutinize all code. So imagine then on a cloud-based, software-based and AI-driven solution under 5G, where you could have up to hundred companies collaborating in developing that code, you have to be able to trust the solution from day one on the get-go. So that's a very important distinction. And also Barry made a very, very good point about this basically being RAN. All RAN and open RAN only affects RAN, obviously it goes with a name. So the critical part, for example, core and, uh, and also how the RAN will interact with um, uh, the core and other parts of the network is still going to be governed by other, uh, other standard setting uh, bodies. And that's a very important point, meaning that ORAN in itself, even if the, its working group on security can introduce all the nice security measures, 
will not be able to cover for all the aspects of security. And another thing that I, that comes with actually uh, with ORAN is that you need to address the security risk on a both in terms of standards, meaning the technical specification that you use in the case of ORAN, but also in terms of the implementation. Just because you have actually agreed in a certain way that different parts can talk to each other, does not necessarily, or that you have a code, does not necessarily mean that you can actually develop backdoors in the implementation. So inherently, the way that uh, OpenRAN will operate will set a higher standards uh, or higher requirement for security than we know today. And that's a very important point. And this brings me to another inherent weakness, if I may say, uh, around ORAN, which is the, the use of open source. Unlike the Rakuten solution that we heard about previously, which is actually proprietary, if you develop an open source solution, it basically means that anyone can or with some contractual uh, arrangement access the code online. That means that not only the security agencies, but also APT groups and traditional hackers have access to the source code. And that's a problem that you have to deal with. I recognize the argument that publicized code also means actually that you have a lot of people looking out for that code and looking for the vulnerability. That is very, very true. But just look at the empirical data that's out there. Uh, the attacks on uh, servers that are Linux based is 430% higher than a uh, proprietary solution. I'm not advocating proprietary solutions. I'm just saying that using open source have completely different set of challenges with, that we, the regulatory agencies are not prepared for. That's a very important point. And uh, as we said, um, uh, or actually Andrew, you mentioned that several of these companies that are involved in the ORAN coalition, which is the, the, the private consortium that we mentioned several times here. And yes, we have nearly 40 companies that are Chinese, but not Huawei. That's a very important point. And I know that a fellow think tank colleagues have sold it as an alternative to Huawei, but exactly as you point out, Andrew, we have China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, who are self-recognized as 100% state-owned enterprises and which operates under Chinese law. And uh, unlike Huawei, where the ownership of Huawei is, well, let's say disputed, uh, at least they allege uh, and claim to be a private company. And I, I'm not gonna make a point about how Huawei is owned or governed. Uh, but one thing that we can be very clear of is that we know Huawei. And if we use Huawei as a benchmark, I'm not making a statement whether it's good or bad. We can certainly say that these companies that are in the ORAN coalition are a bunch of companies we know far, far less. I'm pretty sure that a large share of the audience that is listening in today never heard about Inspur, which is one of the biggest cloud stack and um, AI development companies in China, and also Fitium that you also mentioned. And these are companies that have very strong ties and actually are outright state-owned. One of them is actually even a part of the uh, state military uh, industrial group and self-recognized as these companies. And exactly as you point out, Andrew, they have been sanctioned by the Biden administration. And in a world where we don't trust Huawei. I am not really sure uh, if that's your standard that we can't accept Huawei equipment, why you would accept a single line of code that has been developed or co-developed with these companies. That is absolutely flabbergasting in my mind. And uh, you know what they say, if you have two different standards that doesn't really match up. I think the English word is uh, double standards, right? So uh, there is certain amount of that surely and one very, very uh, strange point here is that if you look at countries like United States and Japan, they are already Huawei free. So you're actually introducing new risks into your territory that originates from China, if you consider China to be a risk. And that I think is an extremely important point that you're not making the network more secure, 
you're actually in introducing a new risk that is inherent with the technology that we need to develop solution for, but you're also building in trust and vendor risk that we have actually been able to mitigate. And I'm not really sure why we should bring ourselves to that point. And also I wanted to make a quick point around uh, vendor diversity because Michal brought that question up. And I, I, I do agree with him to a certain point, but not fully, simply because you said the, uh, the number of players are now down to two. And I'm not really sure, I mean, maybe it's because I'm an economist, but I count at least 17 companies in this space. We have three major players. For some reason, people talk about the two European ones, but some reason, Samsung, which is actually the biggest vendor of 5G uh, radio at the moment in the United States, get always lost. So people count to two, but not to three. And we in Europe, we are looking at a market space where actually we have a market concentration amongst the buyers that is quite significant. And I have produced materials to that extent that measures actually the market concentration between zero and 100, where 100 is a pure monopoly. We can see that in France and Germany, market uh, concentration in the telecom operator space is somewhere between high 30s and up to 50. And in the European vendor market, we have a market diversion, even after exclusion of Huawei and ZTE, that does not exist, ex ex exceed 30. So in the end, let's call it what it is. It's a price problem. European operators are short of cash for different reasons, and they need to have access to low prices. But we are not talking about any price. We are actually talking about Huawei's prices. And that's fundamentally the problem. It doesn't matter if you have 20 vendors in this space, it doesn't really matter as long as none of them matches Huawei's prices. And that's basically what it really, really comes down to. And I want to address the question about um, the, uh, the vendor diversity that also Beryl mentioned here, because I think it's important to point out that all these pieces of Lego that ORAM and OpenRAM promises will not build itself. Someone needs to put all the parts together so whether you believe that you have three vendors in the, uh, the global market uh, in, or the Western markets, or you believe that you have 17, you're probably going to see just one or two more players who become a system integrator, who become experts in putting all these pieces of Lego together. Because the fact is that most telcos in Europe and United States lack the engineering culture in order to become your own system integrator. They just don't have those resources. They don't want to have those resources for cutting overhead and they have no aspirations to be in that space. And that's a very important point to point out. And also if you look at OpenRAN and especially the ORAN consortium, it is a monopoly that is being cut in a completely different dimension, meaning that you have one processor maker try to build an ORAN solution using, let's say, ARM-based architecture. You just can't do it. You have one virtualization partner. You have one RU, et cetera, et cetera. So you're just slicing the market concentration in a different way. And here's where my real problem is. Imagine one of those layers, however small it is, maybe it's just a small little API where all the data passes through and you have no clue who that company is. If it's one of the companies that Andrew just mentioned in the introduction, what are you going to do? You have replicated the security risk all over your own network across everywhere. And with no oversight, because you haven't really had the opportunity to look through that code. This calls for a completely new way of looking at security. As I said, I am not against open RAN. I'm very much in favor of all RAN coming into this space. But all I'm saying is that we are facing a new kind of risk and we need to deal with this issue where basically, if you can't accept a vendor under 3GPP, according to the traditional standards, how can you tolerate these vendors under 5G and Aura? That doesn't add up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hosuk, for that um, thorough 
presentation on the topic. Um, I think that those are many excellent, excellent points um, that are the reason why we're here today to, to delve into issues like those that haven't really gotten proper attention. I thought just before going to a couple questions from, from the audience and another one or two that I've got written down here, I think maybe give Mikal first and Beryl if she's got any follow-up to, I think Mikal maybe had something he wanted to add um, to some of Hosek's comments. Yeah, I mean, first of all, Hosuk's talk was excellent, and, and especially in terms of how we sort of by killing one risk, introducing a whole bunch of others and not really, really thinking about it deeply. Uh, I just wanted to just maybe add a two correction. I, I, I mentioned that there are like five major uh, RAN makers, which would be ZT, uh, of course, Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, then Samsung, and maybe if you add six one, that, that would be NEC, but those are the largest one. I'm, uh, I wasn't saying that's not, they are the only ones. Uh, and I actually, you know, agree with you, Hasuk, on that. Uh, it's not, first, it's not all of them. Second, I uh, just want to clarify, it, this, this is an argument that came from the mobile operators. When you came to them and told them, you know, Huawei, NZT, no good. You need to. You need to. You know. You need to exclude them from your considerations. Uh, they would say, "Well, but then we have now no one to choose from. You are basically, you know, creating a, a monopoly of, of of the two others, and and that's it." So that that's the argument that the mobile operators are introducing. That there is a uh, sort of lack of diversity, which is kind of hypocritical because <laughs> the the big uh, telcos have uh, have uh, uh, with at least partial responsibility for what the what the market looks like now at the moment because that that's 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 kind of their doing yeah so that, that just would be uh, a few points of clarification from my side we have um one question um from the audience who has asked um can you expand on the lock-in position that may emerge at components level through virtualization I wondered if any of our panelists wanted to take a stab at that one. Well, um, I can go if, unless Michal Ambera wants to come in. Okay. Now, I think it's a very interesting point because virtualization is also one of the areas where you will see market concentration in an ORAM based solution. And uh, in the virtualization environment, I just want to make another example here of the security risk. It has been decided, at least in Europe, that the European operators will work with something called the O cloud, which is Kubernetes. I know it sounds Greek to you, and it is actually Greek, but it is a open source AI implementation and uh, where the, uh, the biggest operators uh, Deutsche Telekom, Orange, Telefonica, and uh, Vodafone, and the TIM of Italy, I think, has signed a paper basically say that they will be working on Kubernetes in the virtualization as a Kuber uh, in the virtualization environment. And if you look to Kubernetes, uh, you have about 40 million lines of code that has been provided by Chinese companies like Alibaba, Huawei, and and Baidu. These guys have modified another 80 million lines of code. So here, once again, this will autonomously make micro decision in the virtualization environment in the new European 5G space if you choose Aura. You have no other choices. This is what you're working with. And I think a clear vendor declaration, regardless of which space you're in, whatever your politics are, and say that we are proud to be associated with this open software or we are choosing these vendors. If you have Huawei in your network or if you have a local vendor, I think you should be quite transparent about that. And you should stand by your choice. You must be able to defend them to your consumers and the users and not least the business users who might be depending on the critical infrastructure. I'm not here to challenge anyone's purchase decision. I think they're all fair and just, and there is a proportionality to all of them. 
but I think that the virtualization really points to the, the critical question. If you atomize the base station, what happens? You are going to end up in this space where you have to scrutinize each and every one. And I swear to you, there is no way that you can check through the 40 million lines of code or 80 million lines of code that has been modified the Chinese vendor into Kubernetes. It just doesn't exist. You use it where it is appropriate. And if you think it is appropriate to use it in a critical infrastructure, Europe-wide based on our ramp, that's a decision I can't really comment on. Well, I think we've, in the course of Hosek's comments, and maybe in response to that question, addressed a couple of quite, a couple other questions that came in. But if um, Mikal or Merrill had any thoughts on these, um, welcome to chime in, or we can move on to the next one. But the two questions had to do with, um, and I think Hosek hit this one pretty hard, which had to do with uh, the open RAN elements that are based on open source, open source, open RAN, um, where Chinese companies are some of the main contributors, and sort of asking the question, is that a problem? Um, and then secondarily, the EU expressing an interest in using the 5G toolbox um, to do final security checks of open RAN. And I imagine, you know, these are questions that are related, but if anyone had anything they wanted to add with respect to, you know, those two conundrums, uh, I thought I would open the floor. Yeah, just a, a, I guess, a quick reply to the, <clears throat> to the question on, on open source um, coding. I think there's just a sort of a general misconception that having the word open in this phrase means that it's, it's inherently good, right? If it's open, it must mean it's more accessible. It's been verified. It's been checked. Everything is okay. But that's not the case, as Hosek said. I mean, anyone who has the know-how can go in and modify code or add code or delete code. And unless there is an entity dedicated to checking this, there's no way to know what modifications are being made, how those will play out in real time and who has made them. So maybe open in this sense is a bit of a misnomer, which is adding to the confusion around the, the issue. Thank you, Beryl. I would just, I guess, I mean, to broaden the lens a little bit into the into the foreign policy realm, you know, from 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 my point of view here in the U.S., uh, where I'm based, um, you know, I, I think some of the momentum, and you know, it comes from from a mix of places, I'm sure, but some of the momentum behind this model has to do with the pressure that comes with pre presenting an alternative to um, not just. Huawei and the subsidized um, model, and or, or I should say, lower cost model that it has presented to the world, but this issue exists in the context of the broader Belt and Road Initiative, and this idea that the U.S. is putting quite a lot of pressure on countries around the world not to sign up to what is perceived to be a somewhat flawed or strategically compromising solution being put forward by China, um, and we're starting to see specific and not so specific policy responses being issued by the Biden administration, among others, as to, well, what do we do instead? So as someone who's been speaking about the perils of Belt and Road for, you know, well, since it started, um, that question always comes up, particularly in an, in an international setting. So if we're not to choose the Chinese option, what do you propose we, we choose to solve the problems that we have as it relates to infrastructure, including, including telecom infrastructure? Um, from my point of view, I think part of the support for Open RAN is built on this, this pressure to be able to answer that question. The problem is, of course, that you can't, you know, <laughs> one needs to be careful that in the solution, you're not embedding a whole bunch of, of, of similar problems. And this gets, I think, to the double standard that, that Hosek was pointing out, having to do with, well, let's, you know, Huawei's not there, but other ch Chinese companies are involved. And, Huawei's problems weren't not necessarily unique to Huawei. It had to do with the jurisdiction in which they were operating and their exposure to Chinese influence. So, you know, I would just, I guess, put that to our panelists if they had any response. I think I know what their feelings are on the matter that, uh, you know, 
there needs to be, you know, what is what 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 are the allies to do about this question of what do we do instead um, when being challenged on the decisions they're making vis-a-vis -vis accepting Chinese generosity. Bit of a macro question, <laughs> um, but perhaps I answered the question myself. Um, I'll move to uh, another question that had rolled in, and this one, you know, was another another one that I that I addressed, I think, in my opening remarks, which just has to do with the fact that all of the Chinese. Well, the question is, all the Chinese operators are members of the Open RAN Alliance. Uh, do you see that as a problem? <laughs> I think, if anything, it's telling uh, that the three operators have decided to join the alliance. And I don't know if any of our panelists had a reflection on whether that's an indicative of um, the way Beijing perhaps perceives Open RAN, which is in and of itself a question. Huawei, I think, has uh, not has expressed some, you know, it has not necessarily expressed its support for it. But in the actions of of some of the Chinese companies joining the alliance, one can drive how Beijing at a policy level might feel about open RAN. Okay, just to break the silence, maybe I should jump in, although I don't want to speak for too long, but I think there is a natural reason why Huawei don't join in on the RAN coalition, uh, or an alliance, and it goes without saying because they, they are on the entity list, which basically means that they don't have access to some of the key critical uh, technology and especially when it comes to the chipsets that they can't acquire. That means that they can't actually build all RAN equipment. So they have no role. So why they are not participating is self-evident. I think the question is why are the others participating? And maybe I should uh, try to answer your question, Andrew, by trying to figure out what the Chinese are thinking about their own telco market. Um, aside from Huawei and ZTE, they also have minor players like Datang, um, who are old, except for Huawei, state-owned. We know that for a fact. And these companies have been created thanks to the, the national domestic standards they used to have in China called TDS-CDMA, which deviated from the international standards. So they have created, they already tried the ORAN experiment and they failed. And actually the only successful company that man managed to internationalize was Huawei, the one that didn't want to actually necessarily follow the local standards. So they learned something. Are they planning to use ORAN on a large scale, uh, China Mobile and the China Telecom, China Unicom? I don't think so. Why would they? They have their own SOEs they need to support. And uh, I think ORAN is most of all a, let's say a lottery ticket or a potential bridge to keep a foothold on the Western market. I don't think they, un they understand very well what kind of vulnerabilities it has. And I would be extremely surprised if they decide to deploy it. it aside from an experimental site here and there in the rural provinces, that's fine. But I don't think it will see any major deployment in China for exactly the reasons that we talked about today. That's my just prediction. Well, thank you, Hosuk. And uh, I want to, we value your time and appreciate your interest in our event today. Um, but that takes us to the end of our 60 minute session. I just wanted to thank the audience for their, for their participation and their attendance, to thank our speakers for their excellent comments today. I also wanted to give a special thank you to the US Embassy in the Czech Republic for their support of our economic and financial threat program at the Prague Security Studies Institute, and particularly the project on economic security in the 21st century. Um, and thank you also to our staff at, at the Prague Security Studies Institute for their help putting this on. And with that, I think we can come conclude our session and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.